Ladies and gentlemen, good morning and welcome to panel six of uh, the SEAL conference. With this panel, we are opening a series of, so to speak, green panels and round tables at this wonderful SEAL conference. Our panel indeed is the first in a series of seven other green panels and round tables. And we will present to you kind of a critical evaluation of trade law implications of renewable energy, a proposal for a new WTO agreement, and we also will uh, uh, contribute a more general look at the political economy dimensions of all this. As to technicalities, I warmly invite you to write any comments and questions to the public chat rather than using the question and answer function. And uh, with all this having said, let me now turn to our first presentation on Build Back Greener, Renewable Energy Policies and International Trade Regulation, given by Mandy Meng Fang. Mandy is an assistant professor at City University of Hong Kong School of Law. She holds a PhD from the Chinese University of Hong Kong, an LLM from the University College London, and obtained her LLB and Bachelor in Management at Chongqing University. Her research interests include international economic law, world trade organization law, climate change governance, energy law, and international environmental law. And with all this, Mandy, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair, for your um, tiny introduction. Uh, first of all, I want to make sure that I'm heard. You all can hear me. Okay, great. Um, I decided to not use the uh, PowerPoint for the sake of time. Um, great pleasure to be here with all of you virtually. And today I'm going to present a work in progress paper on China's low carbon energy uh, transition and the international trade regulation under the broad context of building back greener, building back better. So this is what I have been co-authoring with Dr. Joey Huan, who is an associate professor at UNSW uh, Sydney. He's with us today, but I will do the <coughs> So in this paper, we focus on China's subsidies in the new energy vehicle sector, which is critically important for the low carbon transition. And we raise a question. How do China's and EV subsidies interface with WTO rules? Are they consistent or not with China's trade obligations? And in addressing this massive question, we start by investigating how Chinese governments at both the central and local levels have supported this sector and what measures will be subject to the WTO scrutiny, mostly the SCM agreement. Perhaps to no one's surprise, China has subsidized this in the EV sector with hundreds of billions over the past years in the forms like uh, tax exemptions, cash allowances, uh, provision of cheap land, electricity, equity injection, etc. So in order to present a clear picture, we classified all these subsidy policies into three categories on the basis of the NEV industry value chain, so which are the upstream, midstream, and downstream subsidies. By closely examining the evolution of subsidy policies in all these three different segments, we identified an ongoing trend, which is a shift away from the midstream, but towards the upstream and downstream. So here we ask two questions. Does this shift matter? And why is it happening? Answer to the first question, yes. This shift matters a lot when it comes to assessing the consistency of China's NEV subsidies with the WTO, and I will explain this very soon. And the second question is, why is it happening? We proposed two major reasons. Why? One reason is related to a bunch of domestic problems that are happening in China right now because of the over generous midstream subsidies, such as the fraudulent behavior by the NDV makers, the overcapacity, the um, budget deficit. So that is about China's own domestic and EV development. Again, it's just not sustainable or healthy to keep pouring the money to the midstream segment. And then the other reason we argue is actually the influence from the WTO rules and jurisprudence. Why? Because subsidies going to the midstream sectors are highly vulnerable to WTO challenges, as evidenced exactly by all the renewable energy disputes that have been brought to the WTO so far. Each and every one of them concerns the midstream manufacturing subsidies. 
So we argue that the treatability of the midstream segment is very high. So subsidies that go to this segment can easily distort international trade, and that creates challenges from your trading partners. So a following question to ask is, with this shift of policy priority in the NEV subsidies, can China's NEV subsidies right now be immune to WTO challenges? So while we do recognize a higher consistency in China's NEV subsidies, we believe still it is necessary to have a case-by-case -case analysis after all the devil is always in the details. So for instance, the upstream subsidies like those go to the uh, R&D, those for the innovation, if it is provided to support the basic research across all sectors, all industries, or go to universities, research institutions, the risk of being WTO inconsistent is actually very low. But however, if those upstream subsidies, the R&D subsidies are not generally available, but only to certain industries, to certain firms, or to benefit certain technologies, then this can meet the definition of specificity according to the SDM agreement and become actionable. Now let's turn to look at the midstream segment. Again, this is very contentious, and we identified in this paper a number of Chinese NEV subsidies, including those designed for the manufacturing of key components like batteries are actionable or even prohibited. And this goes back to the arguments we raised earlier is that this segment is highly exposed to international trade. So any subsidy can easily generate trade distortion to the detriment of uh, trading partners. Although there might be some policy space under the GATT Article 3.88, that is for government procurement derogation or GATT Article Three, um, sorry, get Article Three, Eight B, which covers the um, transfer, which covers the payment of subsidies to domestic producers. Again, we argue the policy space is very, very limited. There is not much leeway for China to make use. If you check the recent development of the jurisprudence, this is really not much policy space under those two provisions. And now let's look at the downstream side subsidies including those go to the infrastructure, which in this case, the NEV charging facilities, the battery swapping stations. We argue that this actually is the area that can be the safest, mainly because the construction, the maintenance of infrastructure is services oriented, not much about trade in goods. Therefore, the subsidy rules are not applicable in this sector. Therefore, that is safe. And the other type of the downstream um, subsidies is those given to consumers. The consumer subsidies, in theory, those can also be safe because it's generally available to all consumers. But if you design these consumer subsidies to favor certain domestic firms or domestic industry, then it can be problematic. Therefore, the policy makers really need to bear in mind how to not violate the WTO rules. So to sum up, we are now witnessing the restructuring of China's MDV subsidies the shift from the midstream towards the upstream and downstream. And this is surely a welcome step, which not only reflects the evolution of China's industrial policies and economic goals, but also it shows China has taken the WTO rules and jurisprudence in mind, maybe not as much as what its trading partners want, but at least it is. China is bearing in mind this obligations. So that is the positive influence from the WTO rules and jurisprudence on China's policy making. Although this shift makes China's um, NEV subsidies less controversial, we are still concerned that at this stage there is not quite a clear line between legitimate use of subsidies for low carbon transition and the abusive use of subsidies to the detriment of trading partners under the WTO. So in the post-pandemic era, when the world is racing to carbon neutrality, are the WTO rules fit for purpose? So that is certainly something for future research. And here, I think I'm managed within the time limit. Here concludes my um, presentation. If you have any questions, I'm happy to discuss with you later. Thanks. Thank you so much, uh, Mandy, also for excellent time management. Indeed, uh, you have uh, pointed to a very important issue. When we talk about trade and environment, we often have firstly in mind this kind of trade limitations and something. But as you can see from the discussions in the Committee for, on Trade and Environment of the WTO, 
uh, subsidies are uh, very much also to be a critical point in this regard, and certainly we will see more in the discussion. Um, to our audience, I may uh, reiterate that we would be very happy to receive any comments or questions uh, by the public chat that is offered in the conference platform. But uh, subsidies and renewable energies are only one area of the problem. The other area of the problem might be um, local content. And um, local content, in a way, is a question as to how you can develop uh, your green industries. And indeed, um, that has been a question which now is dealt, by, uh, dealt with by Unua Chadash Artantas, who will introduce to us uh, the problems uh, in this area. He is a research institute at the Administrative Law Department of Hachetepe University in Ankara and a PhD candidate at the Butzerius Law School in Hamburg and received his LLB from Ankara University and has been um, a guest to the Max Planck Institute in Heidelberg for some time. Uh, with this introduction, Chandesh, you now have the floor. Very much. Uh, I first want to be sure that I'm heard as well. I'm heard. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Tobias, uh, for the introduction. Um, I will, for the sake of time management, I uh, actually get rid of the a good part of my introduction to the uh, to the to the paper. Uh, thus, I will start from maybe the middle of it. Uh, I will start with the sustainable development goals of the UN. And uh, as it uh, directs us to the UNFCCC and the, uh, the, the, the context of Paris Agreement mechanisms for combating climate change. Um, in my draft paper, I argued that the uh, mechanisms of Paris Agreements, uh, namely the financial contributions and technology transfers, were insufficient to actually ensure a just transition to a low carbon global go, low carbon economy and uh, thus we need i suppose a fairer uh, platform for the establishment of a fair eco a fairer economy uh, but we cannot actually write and and we should also keep in mind that uh, the developed countries have emitted uh, the utmost majority of uh, greenhouse gas emissions in the uh, in the Anthropocene. Uh, thus, we should perhaps ask the question: Right now, are we passing the real burden of the climate mitigation to developing countries and the least developed countries? Uh, perhaps we should keep that in mind. Uh, the quest, keep that question in mind. But I will try to make a perhaps a connection between a topic in the international human rights law, which seems a bit more uh, unconnected uh, until now, it's the right to development. Right to development perhaps is the uh, one of the so-called weak rights in the, right, in the international human rights law. Uh, it's not very well processed, and, uh, but still there is a new convention on the way uh, in, as, as of this year. Uh, but the most important text there on is the uh, 1968 UN Declaration on the Right to Development. And it's, it's to place that the right to development is an inalienable human right with the virtue of every human person and all peoples entitled to participate in, contribute to, and enjoy economic, social, cultural, and political development. Um, thus, I might perhaps uh, comment on that in the direction uh, we, we are actually progressing toward a more fairer if we are progressing toward a more fair and equitable uh, climate climate change mitigation uh, mechanism, perhaps we should keep the right to development in mind uh, when we are uh, connecting the dots. Uh, I should briefly talk about the global distribution of the uh, low carbon economy as well, the green industry, as, in, as it was mentioned in my paper. Uh, there are three groups of countries Right now, in the global arena, uh, worldwide, it's the, the I call them glo one of them as global north, uh, the other one as China, and uh, the rest of the countries 
the rest of the developed and least developed countries. China has a very special position in that in that context uh, because it was in early 2000s. Its its uh, low carbon economy was in was in a uh, infancy, but uh, actually China proved to be successful in terms of uh, low carbon economy expansion. And I think it's owed uh, it to two reasons. One was the industrial success due to due to low costs and the supply chain advantages. The other one was that uh, the local content requirement was in place in 2000s and 2010, uh, 2010s. And uh, of course, WTO challenges toward local content requirements in China uh, was about to prove successful before China withdrew these requirements. But I argue that China was already successful in terms of uh, green economy expansion uh, because of these local content requirements. Other countries, other developing countries has uh, have uh, local content requirements as well. Uh, for example, Brazil, India, Turkey, South Africa with moderate success. Uh, but still there are risk of urgent price claim, climbs in energy equipment is uh, as it's always possible. Bottlenecks of production of rare materials, uh, which are utilized in solar cells and batteries. Uh, we should also keep in mind that China effectively dominates the production of these rare materials as well. Uh, thus, we have uh, the Chinese, Chinese dominance on the uh, solar equipment and battery equipment, and uh, sort of a European dominance on the uh, wind power equipment. Thus, it's a, it's a trade balance, balance between global north and uh, China, but they're, they're the third group of these countries, developed countries and least developed countries, except for China, have problem, economic problems when it comes to uh, promoting their in, the green industry and promoting their uh, low carbon economy. Uh, we cannot actually argue that there is a right to emit right now in, in terms of Paris agreements, but perhaps we should argue something else. We cannot uh, say that there is a right to emit greenhouse gas emissions, but we should perhaps say that there is a uh, right to develop green industry, a right to green industry, right to low carbon economy in terms of uh, international human rights law, uh, in, in which context I'm also uh, following about the uh, new convention on the right to development very closely. Um, local content requirements are also a way of promoting the green industry in terms of uh, promoting the uh, low carbon transition. Uh, but it is the local contents are demand pool incentives, but they are explicitly prohibited in the WTO law. So we should have a measure of perhaps reviving a greenlit subsidy, uh, subsidy way, uh, subsidies to perhaps revive these uh, local content requirement exceptions, or perhaps we could try to apply uh, GATT Article uh, 20 environmental exceptions. But also, it's, it's, uh, in the literature, it's not very clear and. Finally, we should perhaps adhere to uh, the sorry, uh, the national treatment. Uh, the the ah uh, yes, uh, we should perhaps adhere to uh, government procure, procurement uh, principles of the GATS, but it's also not very really supported in the majority voice in in the literature. Thus, in the end, uh, I'm uh, closing to the end of my uh, time. I should perhaps call for a more fair, equitable global climate effort, and also uh, perhaps a leeway, a policy space uh, for developing and least developed countries to develop their green industries. Thank you very much. I yield the rest of my time. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh... 
Shanda is also for uh, for great uh, time management and for introducing uh, this problem uh, for us. I think so far we always have seen local content as a very kind of a specific uh, issue in trade law and you have illuminated to us the backgrounds of it, uh, which is the question of economic development, the right to development. And I like that very much and I am sure that we will have an intense discussion on it. By the way, uh, as to the audience, uh, you are heavily invited to give us questions and comments for our discussion on the panel and with you uh, via the public chat function of uh, this conference platform. But now, I, uh, after having seen a number of details of existing WTO rules uh, on issues such as subsidies or on local content, now we turn uh, to something very new uh, and visionary. And uh, Wei Zhuang now will introduce us to what she has called the positive integration of commitments to provide uh, carbon emission reduction incentives into the world trading system. And uh, Wei has um, done her PhD at Geneva University, and she is actually a legal officer at the United Nations. Previously, she worked at a law firm in uh, Geneva and with the WTO. Uh, also, she was a Marie Curie Fellow of the Dissettle Program and conducted research at the Lauterpacht Center for International Law and the Max Planck Institute, now for intellectual property and competition law in Munich. So on all this basis, which is really kind of a very broad uh, um, uh, broad agenda of your academic career, uh, now Wei, you have the floor and explain to us uh, this uh, visionary new um, agreement. Thank you for your introduction, Professor. <clears throat> I would like to start with a disclaimer. Please note that my, uh, I'm participating in this event in my own personal capacity and that neither my participation nor what, I, uh, what I'm going to say is attributable to the United Nations. <clears throat> so, as you may know, the rationale for the additional governmental support for innovative renewable energy, uh, energy technologies stems from two independent market failures. The first refers to negative externalities of fossil fuels, such as greenhouse gas emissions, and the positive externalities of renewable energy. And the second is technological spillover over in the field of technological innovation. Positive integration, which is defined as the correction of negative externalities, from uh, liberalization. Positive integ integration of minimum standards of intellectual property rights into the world trading system has played an essential role in addressing the second market failure at the global level. The externalities associated with fossil fuels and renewable energies have to be equally addressed at the global level. This paper thus seeks to propose the positive integration of commitment to provide, uh, to provide carbon emission reduction incentives into the water trading systems. For the purpose of this paper, the carbon emission reduction incentives include renewable energy incentives uh, provided to consumers through tax reduction or to the manufacturers through grants, funds, awards. It also includes pricing carbon such as emission trading system or carbon tax. <clears throat> the hashing debt um, for this proposal is that carbon emission reduction incentives is part of the solution to address market failures. The achievement of the objective of the Paris Agreement through a global transition from a fossil fuel economy, a fossil fuel based economy to a green economy, wouldn't be possible without governmental intervention, such as the provision of carbon emission reduction incentives. Because of the negative externalities of fossil fuels and the, positive, the public good nature of renewable energy, the negative externalities of fossil fuel burning um, <clears throat> is. Uh, has been characterized as the most detrimental negative externalities, including uh, 
the emission the emission of greenhouse gas uh, gas emission <coughs> greenhouse gas that pose threats to the stability of the global climate system itself and it also includes environmental pollution and associated uh, house problems it impairs the <coughs> competitiveness of renewable energy on the other hand the renewable energy itself has public good nature um, Renewable energy as a public good um, because those who don't pay for it couldn't be excluded from enjoying uh, its benefits and with enjoyment of renewable energy doesn't diminish the other's capacity to enjoy it at the same time. So there, it, causes, it results in a, a free ride problem and ultimately leading to the trage tragedy of the commerce. Um, the investment and the consumptions of renewable energy would be below socially desirable levels, naturally. Thus, the provision of carbon emission reduction incentives is needed to neutralize negative externalities arising from fossil fuel burning and incentivize the generation and consumption of renewable energy. So what is the legal status of carbon emission reduction incentives at the WTO? Unfortunately, general WTO rules don't discipline members measure to provide carbon emission, induction, <laughs> carbon emission reduction incentives. However, national measures to support renewable energy have been challenged in uh, numerous WTO uh, disputes, such as uh, DS419 China measures concerning wind power equipment, um, Canada Renewable Energy, Canada Filling Tariff Program, uh, India solar cells, U.S. certain measures relating to the renewable energy sector. The public body in the Canada, uh, in Canada renewable energy, case know that the need to address the negative and positive externalities associated with the conventional and renewable energy production informs the government choice of energy supply mix that created the relevant market at issues. Thereby finding that. Uh, the re relevant market should be the competitive markets for wind and solar PV generated electricity, rather than the competitive wholesale electricity market as a whole. This implies that such findings appear um, <clears throat> that if a measure providing carbon emission reduction incentives is designed to internalize externalities or compensate um, disadvantage in a non-discriminatory uh, manner, it may not constitute a subsidy under the, ASCM uh, under the SCM agreement. This understanding probably like many of the US dropped, uh, dropped its subsidy or subsidization claims during the dispute settlement proceedings in India solar cells. So why do we need a, a, a um, positive integration of carbon emission reduction incentives into the water trading system? Um, first, this is informed by the WTO's Sustainable Development Objective. The <clears throat> Sustainable Development has been an overarching objective of the World Trade Organization since 1995. This is explicitly uh, referred to in the preamble of the WTO funding agreement. The principle of integration is at the core of sustainable development. Environmental protection forms one of the three pillars of the sustainable development as well. The integration of appropriate environmental protection measures, such as the provision of carbon emission reduction <coughs> incentives is thus essential to the achievement of the WTO sustainable development uh, objective. Sustainable development is expected to uh, inform all decisions and development within the water treatment system this is confirmed by the public body in the U.S. stream case. The concept of sustainable development has also been invoked by uh, International Court of Justice and the Permanent Court of Arbitration to justify the integration of environmental protection and economic development. Second, this initiative is also inspired by the integration of the minimum intellectual property rights standards into the water, uh, water trading system from the old GATT system to the current uh, WTO rules-based system, international trade gov governance has been moving towards positive integration, such as, for example, the TRIPS agreement. Intellectual property rights are state-created incentives to address market failure associated with technology in, uh, innovation uh, or knowledge spillover. 
And the carbon emission reduction incentives should be created by states to internalize um, positive externalities of renewable energy and ne um, negative externalities of fossil fuel burning. Um, following the precedent of the TRIPS agreement, universal minimum standards for prevention of carbon emission reduction incentives should be integrated into the WTO to stimulate the generation, diffusion, and application of the renewable energy at the global level. Third, this is driven by the need to implement the Paris Agreement. The provision of, of the Paris Agreement could play an interpretive role uh, via Article 31, Paragraph 3C of the VCLT. Yet a trade and climate may become so uh, indivisible that the mere interpretive rule is no longer sufficient to solve the problem at issue. The Paris Agreement ob uh, obliges parties to report their nationally uh, determined contributions and urges them to incentive, um, <coughs> incentivize and facilitate participation in the mitigation of greenhouse gas um, emissions by public and private entities. And the decision, decision was slash CP.21 um, uh, in adopting the Paris Agreement implicitly uh, emphasized the important role of providing incentives for emission reduction incentives, including carbon pricing. Over 19 countries include carbon pricing incentives and 145 out of 194 parties to the UFCCC identified renewable energy actions in their national, uh, in their indices, signaling that the time for carbon emission reduction incentive have, uh, has come. The measures to provide carbon emission uh, reduction incentives are trade related. The failure to provide carbon emission reduction incentives could place renewable energy generated goods or service at a competitive disadvantage with -vis the fossil fuel based goods or service, thereby impeding international trade in renewable energy based goods and service. The implementation of the Paris Agreement via the via global transition to a low carbon economy thus necessitates the provision of carbon emission reduction incentives at the global level, which is also required by the principle of fair trade. It's time for the countries to mainstream carbon emission reduction incentives into the world trading system. So this is to fill the gap in international law and to provide predict, uh, predictability and security for private investment in renewable energy. And the incorporation into the WTO could make relevant rules more credible because of the built in dispute settlement system of the WTO. So I will stop here because, <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Wei, for this kind of a, kind of a visionary, um, visionary idea that you laid out here. I think uh, we uh, international trade law scholars are often very uh, a bit uh, strict and we more engage in interpretation of what is already there rather than uh, proposing uh, real uh, important changes. And I was, uh, I was happy that you embarked through this dimension of the problem. But of course, uh, when we discuss about uh, change, uh, uh, change to do something about climate change, uh, change uh, to come to a more greener energy system, uh, we also have to consider what is the uh, ability of a political system, both nationally, regionally, and internationally, uh, to do the important steps in this direction. And that, of course, is also a question on the kind of the political rationale uh, behind uh, of what uh, what we are discussing here and uh, there is a good reason to look into that more specifically and this is why i'm very happy that uh, alberto costi now will explain to us the changing landscape of the political economy of climate change in the asia pacific region which is a region which as you have uh, already seen is addressed in this panel very often. Alberto Costi is a professor of law at Victoria University of Wellington, New Zealand, and a co-director of the New Zealand Center of International Economic Law. His teaching and research relates to public international law broadly, with a particular interest in climate change and the Pacific nations. He is a graduate from the University, University de Montreal, je m'excuse, 
the College of Europe and the Harvard Law School, and he has held research, teaching, and consultancy positions around the world. And with this, Alberto, now you have the floor. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, perfect. <clears throat> I will try to share my slides, and I will go very quickly through this. Let me see if I'm able to. No, I think I have some difficulties with uh, my slides at the moment. So I think I will simply uh, speak. It's a pity because I had some very nice charts, but I just wanted to, first of all, Naoma uh, Hairemai, Tinakotu Katoa, Talofalava, and warmest specific greetings to all of you present today. I feel a little bit uh, as an imposter in this uh, on this panel because I'm very much more of a general public international lawyer. I am no exper expert in terms of international trade. My interest really comes from the fate of Pacific Island nations. The globe is warming rapidly, temperatures, ex temperature extremes are going off the scale, and tropical cyclones are intensifying, there are more flooding, more landslides, damages to local and coastal communities, and it affects indigenous rights as well. In the Pacific region, this is really a particular problem because the sea level rise is faster than global average. There is a huge increase in inundation of the coast, the coastline, and in fact, uh, greenhouse gas emissions reductions are required urgently. It goes beyond simply mitigation. It really requires, and as, uh, as my fellow panelists have mentioned, changes in the attitude of states. So in terms of climate change trends and challenges, in, uh, in 2018, the, international, the, the Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change IPCC uh, released in a report, a, a preliminary report on the on the, the rise of temperature of 1.5 degrees Celsius, that we had about 12 years to reduce the emissions of carbon dioxide by half. Now we're about uh, three years later, so we still have only nine years. And in fact, the problem is really the carbon dioxide concentration, emergence of temperature extremes, tropical cyclones, and elevated storm surge risk. What we see is that it is still possible, but we need to act quickly or it will be soon too late. There is no doubt, and no one would, and, and all the representative concentration pathways or RCPs that have been uh, pres that have been presented by the inter IPCC make it quite clear that even quite good pro uh, pre forecasts for the future really see still a rise in the sea level for a number of years. Uh, what we see very much is the need for some action. And what I, uh, in, in the projection really suggests an average global temperature of, uh, of temperature increase of as much as four degrees Celsius uh, by the end of the, this century. And responding to the climate crisis, crisis really requires a radical decarbonization of global energy, transport, and industrial systems and replacing cost, uh, coal, oil, and gas with renewable energy technologies. It re, we need to reinvent economic and political norms, but also legal norms, because if we want to be quite honest for the future, especially for the Pacific region, uh, we need to be able to understand that their contribution to climate change is minuscule, it's extremely small. And it is yet the coastal, local and indigenous communities that are most affected by climate, by the global warming. So what really stands in the way of action, it's really the opposition of the, from the most powerful industry in the world, the fossil fuel uh, sector. And also the, with that, there are contrasting national interests between the world's leading exporters and importers of coal and natural gas and oil and the leading uh, per capita carbon emitters that are historically tied to the ongoing expansion of the global fossil fuel industry. And that is contrasted with the neighbors in the Pacific who are among the most exposed peoples in the world. So really what I want to briefly do in the few minutes I have is really to begin by outlining the general political economy of the climate crisis 
explore the dominant political responses that are evident in the Asia Pacific region, and then maybe come up with a look at the future. So I'll be just very quick. Uh, the relevance of the formation of the, inter of the IPCC in 1988 is really that it formed the beginning of an negotiation uh, at the international level over carbon emissions mitigation. Unfortunately, and I don't want to be, uh, be uh, raining on the parade of anyone, but what we have noticed since then, it's a cascade of failures. When mitigation goals uh, we have been unable to reach, we've tried to go towards adaptation strategies. And they are still, for the time being, failing. And what is the next step? Are, are we going to just look at disaster relief management? The costs are enormous. We need to respond to this climate threat because we need to re drastically reduce the production of greenhouse gas emissions and, and carbon dioxide because we what we have as a problem, it's really this idea that we have some states heavily reliant on fossil fuels as a key source of energy and export earning. I put in that category countries like Australia, Canada, the US, Russia, and we have developing economies such as China and India who are now among the world's largest carbon em emitters, but they argue that they should not be penalized in their drive for economic development. So what we see are distinct differences. Why would these developing countries not be able to develop their economies when the industrial societies have done so. And you can imagine that there is the problem with the Paris Agreement uh, is that climate change law is not enough. The NDCs are weak measures. They need uh, robust compliance. And compliance mechanisms are a bit, in my view, fragile in the Paris Agreement. There is really a gap between states that require more and more funding, and it is important, but that this funding will not be available if even developed states have to pay and have to provide for insurance costs that come with the deterioration of, of the climate. Climate change law is not enough. This is too short a time that we have today, but we need to look at other areas of international law, such as, uh, as a law of the sea, uh, international economic law to try and address some of the problems because the climate change represents a fundamental cha challenge to the future of the global economy and the viability of civil of human civilization as as was said about the problem of, of human rights and even the very existence of states so as time really is flying very quickly i just want to say that there is still a, as a dominant response among some economies the business as usual model and it is, it is, uh, there is, there are still <laughs> denial movements in in the world, in the U.S., in Canada, in the in the in the U.K. Uh, that really still are composed these alliances of fossil fuel corporations, industry groups, media that really create a problem that we have been able to harness technology to better master the nature, and we can continue to do so. And there are still support in in the coal industry. And I was I'm even uh, always shocked that even in New Zealand that we like to pretend we're 100% uh, natural as a country. That is not the case as well. We still export vast amount of coal. So at the uh, what uh, the problem with the climate crisis in the Pacific is that we really have this fossil fuel expansion that continues versus the physical vulnerability. And position of Australia is quite interesting because Australia is a, one of the worst leading carbon exporters because of its exports of coal in, uh, to a large degree. At the same time, its neighbors are suffering most of the, the effects of climate change. And Australia, Australia's governments have been continuing with the coal, the, 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 the coal industry, the coal lobby, even among other states in terms of clean coal power that they are trying to sell to other countries. So at the end of the day, the Pacific Island nations are really the ones paying the price. And at the moment, they are at least increasing their voice at the international level. They work with other small development island states in the Caribbean and the Indian Ocean, among AOSIS, the Alliance of Small Island States, and also in a wider number of soft law instruments within the region under the, the auspices of the Pacific Islands Forum. 
So at the end of, of, of the day, when we look at this expansion and when we look at the problem, I think I just want to raise a couple of points. One is that climate change represents an existential crisis for humanity because states, too many states still neglect the global nature of the problem. There is still, I think, the, as, as, a, as a big issue, uh, the fact that there are these there are uh, humanitarian geopolitical concerns, the worsening climate uh, change uh, furthers the fuel and uh, does fuel mass in, uh, migration around the world. It also raises issues about security. Uh, the Security Council has mentioned climate change as a threat multiplier. And with the also the, the greater role of China in the Pacific, it is very sad that the uh, that our countries like Australia, the United States play uh, want to play a more and more important role in the Pacific, mainly because it be, it is very much a geopolitical issues more than an issue more than anything else now i see that my time is up i would have liked to look at the future but i just want to say one thing the when the un was set up we started the negotiation for the un to be created before the end of the second world war we do not need to wait for this crisis to go over to be over we need to work on it and i think i will just if you if the if the chair will allow me just 30 seconds exactly i just want to say that we need to develop multilateral platforms that can prevent this crisis of planetary scale and significance to worsen and that means in part maybe finding uh, going uh, thinking a bit outside the box the emergence of a duty of assistance especially when states request assistance there should be a duty on developed states to help as it's already found in multilateral environmental agreements. We need to also maybe look at the possibility of using a Kimberley-like process, as for blood diamonds, for the uh, to assess the uh, some practices of the of some of businesses, and also maybe looking at the use of blockchains as a way of ensuring that compliance is better obtain under the Paris Agreement. At the end of the day, we must seize the moment as engaged citizens, making the citizen at the center of the problem and allowing NGOs, businesses, large academic institutions, cities to be more and more involved and maybe go along the lines of Pascal Lamy's idea of a polylateralism model or further the notion of Anne-Marie Slaughter's transnational networks or simply having hybrid coalitions of states, non-state actor, actors, central, local governments, and citizens. Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Chair, for having gone a little bit more over time, but Nami Nui, Fakafetai, Minaka Vakalevu, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alberto, for really thinking out of the box, um, bringing us to the history of the United Nations, uh, by uh, speaking their language, also bringing in uh, the wisdom of indigenous people uh, in the areas where you live uh, and combining all this. Um, and I think that is a wonderful frame for us to, to continue. Also your idea to have a ban on fossil energy products. Um, I heard that with much interest. And uh, now for, we, we have some minutes to, to discuss and I would suggest us to, to discuss in the following structure. First of all, uh, I would like to discuss substance because I see something like a continuing line between the papers uh, and one of, uh, I think, the aspects which all the papers in a way uh, alluded to is the question of development. And here also we have two uh, questions from the audience. So uh, Abu Saleh asked us, how does development right? Uh, how does the development right idea could fit within future environment-related trade agreements? And basically, on the same token, also Elena Antoni asked us: Is any right to development in the context of the green green transition really possibly without more flexibility for green industrialized policies in trade agreements? So basically, the two ask us to discuss a bit further the right to development development and the role of um, the role of uh, trade agreements and that is where I would like to make a cut for a second round of discussion under us which would be our uh, action we are talking much about substance um, but we should also talk about action 
and uh, so we can ask Wei, uh, where should uh, where would she see a, a potential forum for her ideas to to materialize on a specific WTO agreement? We can also discuss our, uh, discuss among us dispute settlement because we see climate litigation going on in courts around the world and even in regional and international courts. Why don't we use uh, the WTO dispute settlement in a way of a climate litigation? And of course, thirdly, the lingering question, trade agreements. And there I would like to, uh, to tell us how, where the reach of the trade agreements as compared to multilateral rules. Can we really, um, what can we achieve on a bilateral, regional or plurilateral level? And for which kind of action would we have to have a change in the multilateral system? So I turn back now, first of all, uh, to the question of substance. And I, I would like to, to invite the speakers to give a very a short three sentence summary of how they position their papers in view of development and a development right. Um, Perhaps, um, Shanash, because you were alluding to it directly, perhaps you can start and then Mandy would uh, would be invited to, to come in there also. And then, of course, we would also see Ray and uh, Alberto in this uh, in the sequence. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, I view the right to development as a right in the making. It's not still very clear in the, in the extent of it, the, the, the real power of it. Thus, I suppose uh, we will see much more developmental uh, developmental aspects in future trade agreements, uh, whether they are multilateral or plurilateral. Lateral. And I suppose that uh, it's one of the issues, uh, utmost issues of the 21st century, that we must create a fair and equitable solution for the transition. Uh, just local content requirement justifications for local content requirements was just one of the options. Uh, we can create more options. We can perhaps expand the Paris Agreement uh, and to include more equitable ways. Uh, but still, it's just uh, I view local content requirements as a as an important issue. Thank you. Okay, so Mandy, what would be your take on development? Thank you, Chair. So for this question, I think my focus would lie still in the SEM agreement. I believe there is still a uh, room of improvement to create or improve the certainty for the category of green subsidies. So let's first start with what are green subsidies, which subsidies should be um, granted the status of being safe under the agreement. So that is the uh, perspective I would like to take in addressing this development rights uh, issue. But certainly with the current institution and the dispute settlement, uh, it's uh, very challenging that we can bring some new new, new ideas to it. So I'd like to invite my co-author to share his opinion, because I'm sure uh, we want to have some ideas on this question. Uh, thanks, Mandy, and thank Tobias uh, for the opportunity. Um, my, I don't really have a strong view um, on the development question, but I think there is a very fundamental uh, question about how members should actually distinguish uh, treat and non-treat issues, which is actually a fundamental issue for a long time. So ideally, I think countries should actually draw a distinction in or a division of labor between the WTO or trade organizations and other organizations. Uh, including writing this division of labor in the rules um, and also to set out explicit references or rules in relation to development to provide guidance. As we know that the, one of the most important challenges about you know, the, the panel body, for example, is judicial overreach. Um, uh, one of the fundamental causes of that is because we don't have sufficient or clear enough rules. So I think in the future, there is a strong demand for a clear uh, clarification of the existing rules, either in the trade agreements 
or in other agreements that you know common membership should actually draw a very very clear distinction and also provides a different function for the different organizations okay wow okay way when you even uh uh, touched upon an issue which I had in my back head also, which would be to ask for the proper division of labor, not between the WTO and free trade agreements, but also uh, with the elephant in the room, which is the multilateral environmental agreements. Um, we are hardly talking about that. Uh, I'm always a bit uh, disappointed about that. But first of all, let's finish um, the point about uh, development. I uh, was very happy that both Shalash and Mandy automatically understood that an idea of development would not only um, include that um, the Global South would uh, be uh, supplied with, um, with technology, with uh, products in a way, but also that development would include that they can manufacture those products on their own. The parallels to the ongoing vaccination and patent issues are obvious in a way. Ray, you have uh, addressed in your research intellectual property rights on one hand, yes. and uh, <laughs> our development and uh, this question of, um, of climate change at the other in your presentation right away now. Uh, how would you see development and what would you, be your points about that? Uh, in my view, <clears throat> I think development, should, uh, healthy development is sustainable development. Sustainable development has three pillars. It includes economic development, social protection, environmental protection. So I think the right to development uh, maybe you mainly refers to like economic development. In my view, the economic development is uh, together, is mutually supportive uh, with other like pillars of the system development, like environmental protection. They are not conflicting each other; they support each other. For example, a transition to green green economy, it in fact creates a lot of job opportunities and uh, new industries, and it actually facilitates uh, development. And then the issue is that uh, the uh, they are not at the beginning in the uh, at the beginning stage they they don't have without a subsidy without a financial support they may not be able to compete with the traditional fossil fuel based economy they need some uh, initial support so as to be like uh, to level the play field um, as the the traditional economy so. Once they are on the track, then there will be, uh, they are like definitely facilitating development in a more health, uh, sustainable way. Oh, yes. Thank you. And by the way, we, uh, we just got another question from Armin Steinbach, who is asking us there are big differences across jurisdictions in giving CO2 emissions a price reflecting its negative externalities. This implies competitive distortion. Do trade rules give sufficient leeway to address this problem in reducing the CO2 price heter heterogeneity, e.g. through discriminatory carbon border just, uh, adjustment and carbon taxes? So, Armin, thank you very much for your question. First of all, let me say that we have a wonderful uh, other panel which is specifically ad uh, addresses carbon border um, adjustments. And for that reason, we cannot fully cover it in this panel here. But uh, I would be happy to give this question uh, to Wei because I understand that she is most closest in her presentation to those questions of different levels of policy ambitions on uh, climate change between countries. What would you think about that? Um, thank you for the question. It's very relevant. So. Uh, the problem is, uh, yeah, yes, I think he's right. There is insufficient rules. Uh, there, the, the, the world trading system, um, the W2 rules, when they were negotiated, they, uh, they barely, the negotiators then barely uh, consider the global public concerns, um, like such as uh, climate change. Or climate change was not so alarming in 1990s as well. And then. Um, 
<coughs> with the when the global concerns require uh, the global actions, and then the trade cannot be a fun function itself isolated from other non-trade concerns because trade and not and trade trade and non-trade concerns they are intertwined and then there is no uh, because to price a goods or price uh, um, a service to be treated it has all kinds of elements to be taken into account most of them are not trade related so you can't like uh, uh, only uh, pricing the on the economic component of the uh, goose itself. So um, my my idea is we need to address this, uh, uh, the externalities uh, associated with like uh, the um, um, the renewable energy such as is public good nature uh, because of its public good nature and there is a fossil fuel externalities. It imposes external cost. The polluter doesn't pay, but we need to hold the polluter uh, accountable. And then um, to, um, how to regulate and the, because the w rules is generally is negative uh, integration it basically try to tell member states not to do something but there is a one exception is the trips agreement is about uh, is uh, there is positive integration of the intellectual property rights in, into the water trading systems it's uh, requires member states to provide a minimum standards for rp protection and rp enforcement uh, why because the the intellectual property rights itself is also trying to address the uh, technological spillover, over, which is another type of market failure. Why don't we address, address the positive externalities of renewable energy and or negative externalities of fossil fuels via uh, agreement follow the TRIPS approach? Yes. That's the idea. Yeah. Thank you very much, Ray. Um, um, before I forget it, because we also had it in our discussion right away now, and because we as trade people always have to live with elephants in the room, and one elephant in the room is always that we talk much about the environment, but totally ignore that we have an international environmental policy and multilateral environmental agreements. Um, Alberto, uh, you have been also in advisor to the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, as I have seen from your CV. Uh, would you like in, to come in on that, particularly drawing from what Wei just told us when she was saying uh, environmental problems may not be entirely trade related, but they may have many, many uh, facets and dimensions which doesn't have to do much with trade. So. What would you think would would we need something like a better cooperation also with those multilateral environmental agreements? Hear me now? Yes. Uh, there was a point that Wei made in her presentation, which is very important, and that's the need to interpret international law in a systematic, a systemic way. The systemic interpretation of international law under Article 31 of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties. I think that certainly I, I am not a trade international trade law uh, expert at all. It's not my area, but I'm I, I'm I find that in th these days we tend to be very much categorized and international law is looked through silos, compartmentalized, and I think that it is a great pity because there are issues, and I think you're right, it's not only trade-related, the problem with the, the with that that maybe people in the Pacific have, but I think it's all, we need to look at being able to look into international environmental agreements and, and uh, that principles, general principles that can then apply, apply to, can be applied to many other areas. For me, for instance, when we talk about the right to development, I, I see most in multilateral environmental agreements the notion of a duty of cooperation that come out. If I look at uh, the duty of cooperation, duty of consultation, uh, if I look at uh, the, the fate of Pacific Islands uh, state, for instance, I look at the emergence of a duty of assistance. It is found even in work of the International Law Commission in relation to the law of the sea and, and current work on sea level rise. Uh, if we look at human rights, there is under the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, there are a duties of cooperation under Article 2, under Article 23, for instance. So I think that when we, we look at 
development of uh, rules, whether we, we, we need to look at the whole concept, all, all contexts of international law. I think in recent times, we tend to way too much compartmentalize the issues. There might be difficulties sometimes, but I think we need to, to do that. And, and even, uh, obviously, I think Wei mentioned, and you mentioned the uh, intellectual property rights. I mean, uh, one important element, as far as certainly Pacific uh, Islanders are concerned, are traditional knowledge. And there are ways by which traditional knowledge must be protected. They must be able to use it for their development. And just to, to make a very, uh, very small uh, point, uh, in 2004, there was a severe tropical cyclone in Niue, which is a state in self -go self governing state in association with New Zealand. And the buildings that did not stand the cyclone were those that were built purely with Western material and design. Those that stood the, time, the test of time were those that were designed with touching and other local materials. So I think it is quite important for that. And the right to development, human rights, international environmental law need to all be taken into account in the development, the right to development, which is increasingly a well-recognized human rights. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. Um, I, I think, by the way, you also enriched a little bit further our our notion of development, and I may point back to discussions in the 60s in the United Nations about uh, appropriate technology for developing countries, um, and yeah. they we're speaking about uh, technological uh, dependence or independence. Now I would like to, to turn to action, because we have uh, talked uh, substance so very much and uh, I have a few questions to uh, some of the presenters. So I would uh, like to, to ask Ray later on where her agreement could be uh, in a way uh, brought into uh, existence within the confines of the WTO. Would it be um, a new agenda item of the Doha round or would it rather be a plurilateral? And um, <clears throat> But also, I would like uh, to ask uh, Shalash later on uh, to to explain to us, for instance, if you have a local content uh, condition and if two parties to a free trade agreement uh, would agree to uh, to handle local content differently from the normal WTO rules, and if one of the parties afterwards would rely on that and on a more kind of an open local content rule, would uh, then this party be sure that not other WTO members come in and rely on the existing multilateral rules? And now you have a little bit of time to prepare and to think about, but now I would like to talk to Mendy. Mandy, I would like to know uh, whether there's in, in the Western and Northern world, there's something like climate litigation going on. So NGOs try to bring litigation in all sorts of courts and in all sorts of legal grounds in order to do something about climate change. Why don't we do it in WTO dispute settlement? And I'm asking that to you, Mandy because you uh, very elaborately uh, um, alluded and uh, explained to us that in the area of subsidies, we have several cases where the situation is not really sure. And of course, for um, renewable energy plans, um, it should be sure because we are talking about in investments of millions, if not uh, billions of, you name it, dollars or euros or um, whatever you have. So, Mandy, would it be a good idea for some of the WTO members to really actively go into WTO dispute settlement uh, to see what's possible and what not? Thank you, Chair, for your um, very good question. So I just want to make some observations on whether it is feasible to litigate um, those uh, at the WTO. But first of all, I want to say that I believe WTO at the end of the day is a trade organization. It's not an international or multinational environmental organization. So as long as there are case brought to the WTO, I believe it should be trade related. If it's entirely about environmental protection, I think it is for the benefits of 
all the countries to have a different platform to address those disputes. And right now, for all the renewable energy disputes that we have um, seen at the WTO, like the Canada, Ontario, the India solar cells, and the latest one, the US one, I think I wouldn't categorize them as environmental disputes. I still think at the bottom it's trade related it's a local content requirements so i might uh, disagree a little bit with kadash on whether the local content requirements can be defined as the environmental policy measures because in my mind i think it's the local protectionism but however there should be some policy space for protectionism to some extent but my concern is for such trade disputes like local content requirements if we don't if we ignore the compatibility with the WTO rules, let's just forget about that part. Let's focus on the economic efficiency, on the effectiveness of local content requirements to achieve the industrial policy goals. My question, my answer would be, um, it's kind of mixed. If let's say a country that implements such policy instrument doesn't have a big domestic market or doesn't have the capacity to scale up the manufacturing rapidly, as rapidly as China, then these local content requirements can end up being a very costly instrument for them to use. It's probably not effective or efficient for them to achieve the goals. So for those measures to be adjudicated at the WTO, I think it's not that environmental related, but still more industrial policy related. And whether I think WTO should become the platform to address environmental disputes, I'm afraid my answer is uh, no, we need a better like environmental protection focused platform to um, address that. And notice I got a question from the um, public chat area. It's uh, uh, from Alexandra Monti. Can I address it now because I read the- Yes, go ahead for two minutes. Yeah, okay, thanks. So Alexandra, thank you very much for this question. Actually, uh, what you asked is what I wrote and it's going to be published by Journal of World Trade in this August. So I exactly talked this topic on the trade remedies and how to uh, curb the use of trade remedies to achieve climate change mitigation. So in my paper, I argue this would be the uh, new generation of green industrial policies. It's not about tariff increase. It's not about local content in requirements. It's about the use of trade remedies. It could be uh, anti-dumping, uh, countervailing duties, or the safeguards. And my paper focused exclusively on safeguards, but still I relate a bit to anti-dumping and uh, countervailing uh, duties as well. And those trade remedies, if not restricted duly, they can be very pernicious, right? Especially if you target a non-market economy like China, like Vietnam, you can impose the you can impose the countervailing duties as high as 100% or 200%. So if you impose those high countervailing duties or other types of trade remedies on environmentally friendly goods like e-bicycles. Like Thank you very much, Andy. Uh, good point. Now I'd like to challenge, um, what would you think about uh, the reach, what we can do with free trade agreements and what has to do, be done on the multilateral level? Chanesh, we can't hear you at the moment. Thank you very much for the question, uh, Tobias. Uh, I think plurilateral and bilateral agreements should be last resort. Uh, I, I think that we sh uh, instead of creating a new platform, we should stick with, with WTO and we should perhaps uh, first address the issue at multilateral level. And uh, but However, right now the local content requirements are requirements are prohibited, strictly prohibited, uh, is this. Uh, what I would say that I actually uh, consider a box approach of agreements on agriculture uh, as a perhaps a alternative. Uh, perhaps we could revive the Article 8 of SCM as well, the greenlit, uh, greenlit subsidies, or perhaps we could revive a box, box uh, approach uh, but if it fails, if it fails at the WTO level, perhaps we, then we should seek for another solution. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I think it's important to highlight. I, I see it that Mandy, you and Shadash, you have uh, brought us to two important insights. 
free trade agreements are only a very limited fix and solution because their reach is limited. We need much more kind of a multilateral rule and many have shown to us um, that uh, some sort of a climate litigation in the dispute settlement of the WTO wouldn't really work. No way. What would you think uh, in the WTO at a multilateral or almost multilateral level, would there be a chance and a way to, uh, to realize some of the proposals that were made during our panel? Um. Yeah, uh, if we were to follow the TRIPS approach, um, yes, W2 is the best channel and multilateral is ideal. But <clears throat> nowadays, uh, the TRIPS agreement was able to, uh, I mean, the intellectual property rights was able to integrate it into the world trade system because of the push of the strong multinational companies such as uh, the pharmaceutical companies and Microsoft, and also uh, many uh, developed countries such as United States and the European, uh, European Commission. But nowadays, uh, with uh, the carbon emission reduction incentives, um, it depends on to what extent the member states are uh, what are going to implement the Paris Agreement, and it also depends on the level of development of the each member states and uh, and also their own national circumstances. So uh, there, it may be better to start with uh, a. Pr a plurilateral agreement. I, I noticed there is a discussion at the WTO about uh, eliminating, uh, for, uh, eliminating fossil fuel subsidies. This is a very good start and the um, starting from eliminating ha harm uh, harmful subsidies to uh, uh, support uh, good subsidies like the renewable energy incentives. So actually, I also want to add something. I think to the extent that uh, there is a price on the goods, uh, there are price on the environmental components of uh, goods to be traded. Um, the the trade itself is not purely economy. It's uh, it, it, it's it's also environmental. You know, there is no the trade is with the implementation of the Paris Agreement in particular. The 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 trade is and the climate, climate yeah. protection is intertwined. Thank so there must yeah. Yeah. Yes, uh, okay. I'm, I'm looking to very one, but I think it's fair to say that we have to come to an end now. And uh, with this having in mind, because I understand that you need the 50 minutes to change between the panels. Uh, so I think we, we had a kind of a very good discussion. We had many aspects, it, it went into more general uh, issues of climate change, of international justice, cooperation, and solidarity, should I say. Uh, we were really coming from renewable energies over subsidies, local content, to the more general questions. And I think uh, we have fully uh, fulfilled the mandate of our panel, to, so to say, it, and we were setting a high standard to the other environmental um, uh, events in this wonderful conference. So let me thank you all the speakers for your uh, fascinating presentations given in a accurate time management and for this very vivid discussion. And uh, uh, I wish uh, us all uh, uh, further, many further uh, events here at SEAL conference, uh, which uh, can help us to uh, to improve our knowledge and um, the discourse on uh, trade and environment. And with this, I say goodbye and hope to see you soon. Thank you. Bye. Okay, bye.